consciousness is creating our life experiences. You want to change your life? You don't change the world. You change your own consciousness. The world changes after that. Essentially, that genes express based upon how humans consciously perceive the world. But if you understand you're the creator, then that's the option to stop creating the hell that we're living in and start creating the heaven that we desire. Welcome to Commune. We are on a mission to inspire, heal, and bring the world closer together. Okay, Dr. Bruce Lipton, great to be with you. Jeff, I am so honored to be with you because um, you're making a difference out there in the world, talking to people and trying to uplift them. And that's what everything's all about because we need this evolutionary upheaval at this time. And so thank you for being that clarion that says uh, there's a better way. Oh, man, that's that's very sweet. Yeah, uh, a lot of my uh, conversations these days have been hovering around this concept of the sixth great extinction, and maybe we'll talk about that. But uh, um, we'll see what we can do to uh, to abate that process or be part of the evolution of what comes next. So <laughs> I'd rather be part of the evolution of what comes next than part of the evolution that's going down. <laughs> yes. Well, so I've been uh, saving up sort of a, a mini portfolio of um, topics to excavate with you over the years. And uh, if anything, I'm worried that we won't get to as many of them. But um, well, maybe I'll just spend a moment setting this up and we can back into some of these topics that, that I'm excited to talk about. So to say that you've been a pioneer in the field of epigenetics is, is basically an understatement. Um, uh, and just for clarity for the audience, and we'll get into, you know, some of the definitional work around epigenetics and behavioral epigenetics, but basically this notion that gene expression modifies in response to its environment. And there are myriad different environmental inputs uh, that can influence the expression of a gene. For example, I, I recently uh, interviewed this very fascinating doctor, Kara Fitzgerald, who's part of the emerging field of epinutrition, essentially studying how different foods influence the, the coding of proteins. But one primary arbiter of gene expression is belief, essentially that genes express based upon how humans consciously perceive the world. And, and you've obviously written brilliantly about how perception shapes biology and in many cases trumps our, un, our conventional understanding of DNA. So obviously this work opens up so many interesting doors into the nature of consciousness, the placebo effect, quantum physics. Um, and maybe we can back into some of those topics by first examining a very tangible way that people experience the relationship between perception and biology. And that is through the experience of fear, which is a uh, omnipresent and prescient topic today, uh, given everything that's going on in the world. So maybe let's, we'll back up a couple millennia. So for the overwhelming majority of our human history, Homo sapiens existed as, as hunter gatherers and we evolved certain um, adaptive phenotypic traits that comported with, with foraging on the Serengeti. So 200,000 years ago, Bruce and I go out and roam the savanna. We're searching for food to bring back to our clan. And all of a sudden, a saber-toothed tiger or some odd-toed horned ungulate <laughs> springs forth out of the underbrush. And it's furiously running towards Bruce and I. So as a place to start, can you describe the neurobiological cascade that is triggered by the perception of threat. Before we even get to the human aspect of this, you have to recognize something called the biological imperative. What the hell is that? And that is, it's the drive to survive. Uh, and all organisms, this is the point why it becomes critical, is organisms as the bottom organism, bacteria. They are endowed with a biological imperative because if you try and kill a bacterium, it's not going to go, oh, okay, kill me. It's going to do everything it can to stay alive. So every living organism has a drive to stay alive. Well, in that case, it also then has an awareness of what could 
you know, compromise that alive. Uh, and then we build up a, a, an awareness of the scary things that could threaten us so that if they show up in our world, then we're going to immediately make a response to protect ourselves. Uh, let me just before, because we might get into this later, there are two aspects to the biological imperative, survival of the individual, yourself, let's say, uh, which is meaning why you, you, know, you seek air, water, food, you know, shelter and things like this, because this keeps us alive. The second one is also very critical because the second part of biological imperative is survival, not of the individual, but survival of the species, which means there's a drive to reproduce to keep the species alive. So uh, we can talk about the individual one first, okay? So it says, when threats come into the environment, the biological imperative is the first to waken you to the threat, okay? Where is it? Well, that's what he said. Well, in the neural system, I go, we don't even know where it is. And it was there in bacteria before there was much of a neural system. So all of a sudden it goes, boy, we don't know where it is, but we know it exists. <clears throat> and, and the relevance about that is that we all live by this biological imperative, which protects us. Okay. And then I said, well, as you said, if a threat is looming, then the biology switches its um, action, community, organization from growth into protection <clears throat> and they're mutually exclusive i'll just give you a reason why if there's a stimulus that offers growth you go to that stimulus and you go with your arms open to take it in assimilate <laughs> it's growth it has to it could be food it could be love i don't care you open up you go to the stimulus open up and take it in that's growth protection you go away from the threat <laughs> And you close yourself down in protection. I say, guess what? You can't be in growth and protection at the same time. They're mutually exclusive behaviors. So when we get into protection, we shut down our openness and our growth in the world. And we start to look at how can I preserve myself in this threat? Okay. And I say, well, how does the body make a response to this? I go, that the hypothalamus, which interprets the signals, interprets the fact that there's a threat. And when it does that, it sends a signal to the pituitary gland. The brain, hypothalamus, says, oh, this is a threatening situation. And it sends a signal to the pituitary gland, which in high school was called the master gland, because its secretions control 20, you know, 50 trillion cells that are in your body. And then in a state of threat, the pituitary sends a signal to the adrenal glands, which in school was called fight or flight. And all of a sudden it says, what happens? The adrenal stress hormones go to the body and they redirect the system. They take away uh, the energies that are involved with like growth, the energies uh, involved with the immune system. And I go, why? Look, if you're being chased by a saber tooth tiger, bacterial infection is not your big deal at that moment. Okay. And the immune system uses tremendous amount of energy because when people get sick, sometimes they don't even have energy to get out of bed. Okay, so what are we talking about? When we get in stress, we want to allocate all the body's energy to escape. And escape uses arms and legs. So I go, your yeah, energy is where? In the blood. <laughs> so I go, so what happens when stress hormones come in? They redirect the flow of the blood. And they take the blood and preferentially send it to the arms and legs because that's where the energy are, is going to activate to get me out of there. And I go, well, preferentially, where was it preferentially before the stress? I go, it was in the gut, the viscera, all the organs in here. And I go, well, what were their functions? Growth, maintenance of the body, cleaning up the system, preparing the energy, you know, taking care of the machine more or less, okay? But at the moment stress hormones are released in the body, the blood vessels in the gut respond to the stress hormones by squeezing shut. And when they squeeze shut, that means the blood is not really going into the gut, but it's now going preferentially into the arms and legs. And that's where we want to get that energy to run. So number one, stress hormones shut down the growth mechanisms of the body. Number two, they shut down the uh, immune system because that's a high energy system that is not relevant to an external threat. And then number three, which I always call the adding of insult to injury, is the blood vessels in the conscious brain are energizing conscious creativity, thinking, you know, an action like that. 
But the conscious brain is very slow processor compared to the rest of the brain back here called the subconscious brain. And the subconscious brain is not only extremely fast beyond conscious brain, but it's a million times more powerful. So what happens is, remember I told you the blood vessels uh, in the gut constrict with stress hormones. That's where people get that butterflies in the stomach kind of feeling, queasy feeling, because what's going on? The blood vessels are all squeezing shut. You can feel them, <laughs> and that's the queasiness. But then the stress hormones go into the brain, and they do the same thing in the conscious blood part of the brain. They squeeze the blood vessels shut. I say, so I'm not nourishing or energizing my consciousness, but when I squeeze it shut, the blood is then sent to the back of the brain where the subconscious has reflex behavior, reactions, high speed, very fast. We become less intelligent when stress hormones are there because we're not using thinking, we're using reflexes. Uh, and that's a completely different way of life. So I say, so what happens here? I say, well, growth, taking care of the body. Threat, get the energy into the arms and legs as best you can and run like hell. <laughs> get out of there. But at the compromise of what? Well, you're shutting down growth, you're shutting down the immune system, and you're shutting down intelligence. And I go, you don't need that to escape from the tiger. You just need fast arms, legs, and reflexes to make them go. I go, well, this is really great. Back, you know, two, three hundred thousand years ago, uh, where uh, the only real threat we had was the saber-toothed tiger. I go, so what? I say, well, if you're running from that saber-toothed tiger and you escape 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you're, you're gone, you're safe. Then you return back at growth again, maintain the body. Today's world, the threats are so, so many of them out there that we're not uh, on uh, stress hormones for 10 minutes, we're on stress hormones all day. <laughs> and I go, well, what's the consequence? Well, they say all day you are inhibiting the mechanism from taking care of itself. And I say, today we have a health crisis. I go, yeah. A lot of people up until recent times said, oh, the genes, the genes are causing the disease and all this kind of stuff like that. Fact of science, less, less than 1% of disease is connected to genetics. I was saying, well, then we have a health crisis. Where the heck is, where is all this coming from? And the answer is stress. Over 90% of illness is directly loaded to stress. Why? Because it shuts down the immune system. It shuts down the growth. You are weak. And it was only for a short period years and years ago. But today, that period of stress is extended so it's like 24-7. And I say, well, that is the major compromise of life on this planet, the fears. And I go, well, it's real interesting because the media loves to give us all the fears <laughs> and manipulates us. So when you watch the news, you're just dripping stress hormones through your body, compromising yourself. And so it's a point where we have to get out of this continuous chronic connection with fear, which is everywhere on this planet. Just watch the news, surf the web, you know, look out your window and you can see this place is crazy and everybody's trying to do what? Well, you know, fear closes you down. Well, you can't survive. Why? Because you need to be engaged with the world and respond to everything. But if you're closing yourself down, you pulled yourself out. And that's where uh, disease starts to begin. Uh, and it's at every level, you know, it's like people are thinking, oh, well, cancer is caused by genes. I, I just love this as a fact of science, right? There's not one gene that causes cancer. There's no gene that causes cancer. They're called oncogenes, cancer genes. I say, well, because they used to say, well, that's the responsive thing that's responsive to uh, your cancer right there. And I go, genes do not cause cancer. What the result is that consciousness will engage those genes if we're out of harmony, if we're in a stress situation. So I say, well, well then the gene didn't turn on and do that. It was the consciousness that activated that gene. So for example, most women are very, of course, concerned about what is called the breast cancer gene. Oh, that's the gene that causes breast cancer. I say, no, it doesn't cause breast cancer. It's associated with breast cancer. Did it cause the cancer? No, no, it was activated by a problem. And that problem is uh, repressed anger or you know repressed emotions that weren't allowed to express themselves. Then you activate the gene. We've been blaming the gene. I go, no, the, the gene didn't even do this. It was us. And I go, that's the difference. I say, what's the difference? I say, 
If you believe the gene did it, then you're acknowledging you're a victim. My genes there, I had nothing to do with it. I, I didn't pick these damn genes. I can't change these genes. And these genes are turned on and off by themselves, according to the story, which means I'm a victim of my biology. And I go, but genes didn't do this. <laughs> it was our response to the world that did this. And I go, wait a minute, our response to the world? I say, yeah, your consciousness. And I go, why is that significant? Change your consciousness and the disease is going to disappear. Or the, the consciousness can cause a disease, or a change of the consciousness can cause the d disease to change. The difference is this. First story, victim of heredity. Genes did this. I have, I'm a powerless victim. Give me drugs. <laughs> uh, the new story is I, through my disharmony, are causing a cancer, which then leads to a very simple understanding is, well, then what if I return to harmony? I go, well, then the cancer disappears. <laughs> as simple as that. Uh, and all of a sudden it says, first story, victim. Second story, the new science, epigenetics, where consciousness is controlling the genes, master. So we go from victim to master with a change in the science, because now I'm going to give the power back to the people rather than saying, you're a victim of your genes. You had nothing to do with it. Now I'm going, oh, no, you're the creator of this. And all of a sudden that changes how we look at the world after how many years of being programmed to be victims. And then we find out, no, my God, we're the creators. Well, for the creators, then where the hell the issue is? And I go, well, that's the programming we have to deal with. Yeah, yeah. God, so interesting. Okay, so many threads to pull on there. Um what was once an adaptive advantage, essentially, this HPA axis response to threat has become maladaptive because of the systems and structures that we have reified in our society. So, for example, fast forward to the Serengeti of Facebook, for example, um, which I often call the largest non-consensual psychological experiment in history. <laughs> it is, yes, yeah, sorry, it's true. <laughs> and, and we're spending, especially, uh, I have three daughters, particularly teenagers are spending an inordinate amount of time, well, not on Facebook, but <laughs> on all of these platforms. And these algorithms are, are designed for the hind brain, basically, to leverage negativity bias through fear and outrage in order to maximize views and watch time, et cetera. And the result is this chronic secretion of neuromodulators and hormones um, like cortisol and, and epinephrine, et cetera, when we become um, very uh, entrenched in this sympathetic overload, which I think what you're saying is having really detrimental impacts on, on human physiology. So I'd love to kind of dig into that mechanism a little bit how do, let's say, you know, we are in this constant state of low grade fight or flight, and we're having a hormonal response that is concomitant with, with the sympathetic response. How do our cells at the cellular level, how do we know? How, why are they acting differently? How are genes turning on and off in response to serum hormonal levels? Well, the first thing we have to understand is this. The, the entire belief that genes turn on and off by themselves is a totally false statement. Because by acknowledging that, then you're saying, well, I have no control over it. The genes did it, okay? But we don't know. Genes are blueprints. They're there to design what are called the proteins of the body, 100,000 different proteins. The, the proteins are like Lego pieces that you can assemble them, the 100,000 different proteins in different combinations, make a muscle cell with one combination of proteins, a nerve cell with a different combination already. So I say, yeah, but these are the proteins that create us, and these are the proteins where life comes from. I say, but what about the DNA? I say, well, proteins wear out. That They're, they're called labile, not stable. Labile, meaning that uh, they fall apart. <laughs> you put a piece of meat on a plate and we come back next week, that meat is not going to be the same as it was when we put it out there. It's going to start to break down, fall apart. So proteins that naturally keep falling apart, but then you have to replace them. I say, yeah, but proteins are complex molecules with a complex structure. And I go, oh, I said, well, then how do I replace these complex structures? I say, there are blueprints a blueprint to make this protein or that protein, 100,000 proteins. I say, they're blueprints. I say, what do you call a blueprint? I got a gene. A gene is a blueprint. 
I go, oh, a gene is a blueprint. Uh, and then we told people, well, they were self-emergent, which means, oh, they turn themselves on, they turn themselves off. I say, no, look, let's be honest about a blueprint. We go into an architect's office. She's working on a blueprint. You lean over her shoulder and you ask her, hey, is your blueprint on or off? And she'd look at you like, what the hell are you talking about? There's a blueprint. There's no on and off. And I go, precisely. The difference is you can read a blueprint or not read a blueprint, but the blueprint doesn't read itself. And all of a sudden I said, then for years we were saying the blueprint was turning on and off by itself controlling you. And now we know, no, it's the consciousness that engages the blueprint. I say, how does it do it? And I say, through chemistry. Different chemicals cause different responses in genes. A matter of fact, that's what I did in, in 1967, which is I know like 40 or 50. It's a long time ago. <laughs> and uh, what did I do? I had genetically identical cells, cloning cells, and I had three plates with genetically identical cells in them, but I fed them different culture medium. I said, what's culture medium? Well, that's the growth environment. I go, yeah, but what is culture medium? I say, laboratory version of blood. So if I'm going to grow human cells, I say, well, it's human blood made out of. And then I go into the lab and with a recipe, I make culture medium match human blood. Okay. And so I go, so what? And I say, well, because I'm creating the mixture, I can change some of the composition. So I created three different combinations of chemistry called culture medium, slightly different. And I had three plates, genetically identical cells in all the plates. And what I did is I fed one plate with culture medium version one, another plate with culture medium version two, and a third with culture medium three. And I said, well, what was the result? They were all genetically identical. I said, well, in one environment, culture one, the cells form muscle. In environment two, the cells form bone. In environment three, the cells form fat cells. And I go, well, wait a minute. I'm teaching that genes control life. And here we have an experiment that reveals all these cells are genetically identical then what was the cause of why one becomes bone and one becomes muscle? And the answer was, it wasn't the cells. It was the environment, the culture medium. And I go, wow, that's really neat. That's the foundation of what we call epigenetics. The genes didn't control this. They were controlled by the environment that the cells were in, okay? So I go, so what's the significance for this? I go, well, a human, uh, when we see ourselves in a mirror, single entity, and I go, well, that's an illusion because we're made out of 50 trillion cells. The cells are the living entity. Bruce, by definition, is a community of 50 trillion sentient cells. So I go, oh, so the cells in our body, uh, our body is like a skin-covered Petri dish. It's got 50 trillion cells inside. I go, yeah, but it also has the original culture medium. I said, what was that? Blood! And I go, then what? And I say, it doesn't make a difference if it sells in a plastic dish or the skin-covered dish. It's still controlled by the environment culture medium. In the plastic dish, that's the one I put in there. In your skin-covered dish, your blood is your culture medium. So bottom line is this. It's the chemistry of the blood, the environment, that activates expression of the gene. And I go, ah, now comes the most of Well, what, where's that chemistry come from? I go, the brain is the chemist that puts the chemicals in the blood. But then comes the ultimate one that Jeff has been waiting for me to say, and that is simply this. So what chemicals should the brain put in the blood? And the answer is, whatever thought you have, the brain will translate that into complementary chemistry. There's a chemistry for love, which is a different chemistry than fear, which is a different chemistry than anger. And I go, oh, uh, uh, and so basically says this, if I hold a picture of love in my consciousness, my brain translates that into love chemistry, dopamine for pleasure, oxytocin, bonding, vasopressin makes you more attractive, keep your partner, and growth hormone, which does what it says. So if I have a picture of love in my head, I'm a healthy person. Why? Those chemicals when in my blood are going to enhance my vitality. That's why when people fall in love, they glow. That glow of health is not an accident. It's the result of the chemistry. But I say, but if I have a picture of fear in my head, I don't release love chemistry. As you mentioned, uh, Jeff, just a moment ago, we start to release things like stress hormones into the blood or factors that affect the immune system to protect us and shut us down. I go, wait, the chemistry of love is totally different than the chemistry of fear. But to the cells, they respond to the chemistry. So there's a behavior that's associated with love, vitality, health, and that's why love is so cool. 
but there's a different behavior associated with fear because it's a shutdown of the mechanism of protection, wall yourself off, save yourself, and stuff like that. And I'm going, so here's bottom line. We used to say genes control us. We're victims. We didn't pick them, can't change them. They turn on and off by themselves. The new science, epigenetics, and epi means above. So epigenetics is above the genes. That's where the control comes from. Oh, consciousness. You change your consciousness and you change the chemistry of your blood, which and then in turn changes the uh, genetic activity. And all of a sudden it says, then I'm not a victim of my genes. Damn it. I'm the master of my genes because it depends on what chemistry I'm going to send to the cells, which then is dependent on what is my consciousness. And all of a sudden it says, oh my goodness, we're not victims. We're, we're creating this. Uh, but if you didn't know it, then that's when it goes to victim. It's like, well, I, I don't know how that happened. I go, well, I'll tell you how it happened now. It was what you were thinking that created the chemistry, which in turn adjusted the genetics to complement the vision. Hmm. Well, there's so many um, <clears throat> potent metaphors to, to draw there. I mean, you know, we, we think about the social medium for cells being in a Petri dish. It's called a culture. Well, of course... You know, we have a human culture too, and if you stick an individual in a caustic or toxic culture, probably going to end up with the same result if you stick a cell, a pluripotent stem cell, in a in a toxic uh, petri dish. Right? I mean, there's there's a metaphor there. That's a hundred percent right, and and that's why you know if we really start to go into a lot of discussion about what where's culture coming from and who's controlling the ideas of the culture because they can then control the chemistry of the of the people in that culture uh, uh and it's interesting because in today's world because there's so much movement of people from one place to another place that let's say the culture in japan uh which has its own correlation of certain diseases associated with japanese cultures but if the Japanese individual comes and lives in the United States with a different culture, we have different stressors over here, they end up with different diseases. So the diseases weren't accidents. The diseases were correlated with, with the culture from where that person is living. Yeah. And of course, we're exporting uh, things like the standard American diet to places like Japan, right? And so we're, so on a nutrition level, we're becoming more uh, homogeneous as a global oh, homogeneous world. and down and downhill <laughs> not, not homogeneous going up but homogeneous going down because the vitality of the world is under so much threat that, that we're in a global health crisis not local global health crisis uh, uh, and it's not based on the genes it's based on the culture yeah and and if you start to pull this thread even further, you know, this constant fear cycle, which, as you've eloquently described, triggers the secretion of cortisol, uh, epinephrine, adrenaline, etc. Those have very specific knock on impacts as it pertains to like metabolism, for example. So, you know, uh, high levels of uh, cortisol is going to uh, trigger um, high blood glucose levels. Um, and essentially, we know that chronic high blood glucose levels are concomitant or causative for, uh, you know, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, cancer, you know, all, all these um, diseases associated with, with chronic inflammation, for example. And of course, then we say, well, wait a minute, I thought cardiovascular disease was hereditary. Um, but, but no, so I, but this is very few people are just... This uh, are, are disentangling this matrix here, which we're looking at all of this efflorescent levels of chronic disease and we're scratching our heads and saying like, OK, more statins, you know, metformin, you know, all this stuff. When really, if you go upstream and you start to unpack some of the things you're talking about, this uh, interconnected relationship between belief and biology, then it becomes almost glaringly obvious on a chemical level, like this is not a woo-woo thing, <laughs> uh, that the biochemistry is, is right there. So um, I'd love for you to maybe get into, put on your cell biologist hat a little, and you can obviously take this wherever you want. Um, but I, I'm interested 
to know how the cell actually uh, perceives, how it is, is a, um, how does it, what, what methods does it have at its disposal for perception? So let's say there's high concentration of, of serum cortisol. How does the cell even know? <laughs> okay. How do we know what's going on in the world? Uh, well, you have eyes. I can see. I got nose. I can smell. I got ears. I can hear, taste, touch, pain, temperature. I got love, emotion. I got fear, emotions. I got I got senses out of all this. I said, well, how would you get them? I said, I got receptors. An eye is a receptor. An ear is a receptor. I said, at the cellular level, cells have receptors, not as complex, but there are protein like antennas, like TV antennas that are tuned to different frequencies of what's going on. So a cell in its skin has receptors just as a human has receptors, eyes, ears, nose, built into its skin to read the environment. So the cell needs to read the environment so it can adjust its behavior to survive, biological imperative. Uh, what's the behavior I need in this environment? Well, I say, well, what is this environment? I say, well, I have to read it. So I have all these receptors, okay? The brain sends the signals which respond to those receptors. And so they determine uh, which signals are going to be released into the blood are going to go to the cell. The cell has receptors like we have on its skin, reads the environment, and then adjusts its behavior. Uh, and the significance about this is, then here comes the critical part. An amoeba lives in the outside world, in a pond, okay? I say, well, as an amoeba, as a single cell, it's reading the world around it to adjust itself to that world. But then I go, what about my liver cell? I go, what do you mean? Well, it's supposed to respond to the world. And I go, yeah, but it's inside. How does the hell know what's going on outside? Because I have to adjust my cells on the inside to match what's going on on the outside. That's where all of a sudden a, a new thing is introduced. There's the environment and the cell, which is going to respond to the signals. But the cells are not in the environment, so they can't see it. I say, well, how do they see it? And I say, the brain reads the environment and then sends the appropriate signals to the cell to control its function to stay alive in that environment. Everything's cool except for this. We can interpret that environment so two people can get the exact same signals but have totally different behavior based on their experiences. So the point is, my liver cell has no idea what the hell is going on outside, except it takes the signal from the brain. And if it's a, an individual who's afraid, then the signals coming from the brain are the stress hormones and say, get ready for fight or flight. But the same a person sitting right next to them in the exact same signals reads it totally differently and says, no, it's okay. I go, then the liver cell in that person is not getting the fear. And all of a sudden, then I say, well, the behavior of the cells in person one is different than the behavior, and yet we're in the same environment. I say, well, how'd that happen? Interpretation. Right. And culture. It's so fascinating because, you know, if a snake slithered across the, the floor here in the studio, I might go right into fight or flight. In fact, I would because my father was incredibly uh, scared of snakes, and he, 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 uh, he taught me that behavior. But in some cultures, or for example, there was a, I can't remember what a snake expert's called, a her, herbologist? Herpetologist. Uh, herpetologist, yeah. Um, if, if that person would clearly be able to identify that that snake was not poisonous. That's right, yeah. So both, both these guys, the herpetologist and the other guy walking down the same sidewalk, snake comes across totally different behaviors, totally different. And, and then I say, but one of them is a stress response. And the other one is a knowledge response. Oh, yeah, look at that snake. I'm very familiar with that snake, blah, blah, blah. I can pick it up. I can hold it. I'm not afraid. You, on the other hand, will run like hell if the snake comes even close to you. I go, same signal, totally different response. Why? Learned. They were learned. As you said, your father brought that concept of the fear into your world. You bought it, and now you're afraid of snakes. Yeah. So let's say uh, I re recently interviewed a brilliant guy. I'm sure you know him, uh, Gabor Mate. So he talks a lot. Yeah, brilliant guy. Just, oh, man. Um, and, uh, you know, he talks a lot about trauma-inducing events then, uh, that are then concomitant with disease. So let's say abuse or neglect. Um, how is abuse or neglect... Um, 
recognized by ourselves and how does that change the mechanism of protein synthesis? For example, are, th does abuse and neglect or a trauma-inducing event cause like DNA methylation such that certain genes don't express or do express? Can you untangle that uh, mechanism for me? Yeah, well, basically, I said well, the, the, the nucleus of the cell has genes. Genes are programs. We used to think they were read-only. You got this gene? You got that program, nothing you can do about it. We now know epigenetics says, no, genes are read-write. <laughs> I can read the gene, but I can also alter the gene. I say, why? Because as environments change, I have to adjust myself and my behavior to survive in that environment. If it's a threatening environment, I'm going to have to do some kind of protective mechanism to stay alive uh, versus if it's a healthy environment. That's a totally different behavior. And I say, well, how do I learn these things? I say, well, experiences <laughs> that you have. Uh, but also, most importantly, as you brought up, and this is really critical, is we download in the beginning experiences from other people. Uh, and I'll give you a simple reason, just simple. In the old days, not like today, you would go to the store and buy a computer. And I'm saying the computer because the brain is a computer, so I'm going to parallel right here. You bought a brand new computer. You took it home. You plugged it in, you push start, the screen lights up, it's booted, it's ready to go. I got a brand new computer. I say, okay, now do something. Write a story, do a drawing, you know, surf the web. You say, I can't do it. I say, you got a brand new computer. I say, first I have to put programs into the computer and then I can access the programs. With no programs in the computer, I got a screen that lit up, but nothing, no place to go. There's nothing, no program. So the child's brain, a computer, screen on that child's brain boots up in the last trimester of pregnancy. And I say, okay, use this brain. I go, no programs, can't use it. So I say, oh, the first seven years of a child's life, the machine brain mechanism is designed to download programs. I said, where'd you get the programs from? I say, ah, the first seven years of your life, you're in a state of hypnosis. I go, so what? I say, Whoever you focus on, you will download their behavior, just like a video recorder. You focus on your mom, your dad, your siblings. You focus on the community. See how they do things. I go, you didn't just see how they did things. You recorded how they did things. So the idea is this. Now that I have some programs, I can engage those programs and I'll have behavior. Okay? But now there's only one other, other, other problem here, uh, and that is most of the programs that we have downloaded from conventional understanding psychology are programs that take away our power. You know, they limit us in our capability. They self-sabotage us. And these are programs that we download in the first seven years. And I go, significance is clear. The conscious mind wasn't working when the downloads were coming in. I say, so what's relevant? I say, well, the conscious mind can, can review and say, this is a good program. This is a bad program. I say, no conscious mind. All programs were downloaded. Good programs, bad programs. Turns out about 60% of the programs of behavior that we downloaded by observing family and community are behaviors that disempower us. I go, geez, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, it just our programs are, are sabotaging us. We didn't pick those programs. We just downloaded them. Okay. And I go, but what are these programs? Because they control our life. I go, they control your life. I go, yeah. Remember I said the first seven years is downloading and program. But after age seven, and this is an important fact of science, 95% of our life behavior is not coming from the creative conscious mind. That's the one with wishes and desires. I say, Jeff, you tell me what you want from life. That's a creative thought. You say, oh, I want health. I want a great relationship. I want a good job, blah, 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 blah. And I go, that's great. And then I say, I is that conscious mind, the one that's going to steer you to, to manifest things. I go 5% of the day. That's how much because 95% is straight read out from the programs. Yeah. But if 60% of those programs are disempowering, then 95% of the day, 60% of that you're sabotaging yourself. And then you go, Oh, well, I would see if I was, you know, engaging behavior that sabotages me. I go, no, you won't. <laughs> I go, what do you mean? I said, why are you playing these programs, when you have a conscious mind that's a creator mind that can manifest what you want. And, uh, and the monkey wrench in the game is this, and this it's the most important monkey wrench, and that is what? The conscious mind, which has wishes and desires and can steer you 
to those destinations can also think. I go, think? I said, what, what's that? I said, consider your body as a vehicle with a steering wheel. When the conscious mind has got its hands on the wheel, it's looking out the window and driving us toward wishes, driving us toward desires. I go, great. But if the conscious mind is thinking, it's not looking out the window anymore. Why? A thought is inside. You want to think? Go inside your head. You have to think. You can close your eyes. You can think easier with your eyes closed. Well, I'm going inside. I go, well, if you're going inside and thinking, then you're not looking out. I go, that's the problem. Because give you a simple example where it could be the biggest problem. I say, you're driving your car with your conscious mind. I'm going to go here and I'm going to turn at this place. I'm going to do all this and you're driving and all that. But what if you start thinking about, well, oh, geez, when I get to the store, I'm going to buy this and I'm going to buy that. And I say, oh, you're thinking. I said, at that moment, you're not looking out the windshield. I go, you're driving the car? You're not looking out the windshield? I go, don't worry. The subconscious has a program of driving the car because you it was a habit you acquired. So I guess what? The moment I'm thinking, I let go of looking out the window the subconscious is autopilot. It will step in, grab the wheel and drive me, but not drive me to my wishes and desires conscious mind. It will drive me to wherever direction uh, the person I downloaded the behavior from. If they have a glitch in their behavior, then when I'm not paying attention, I'm playing that glitch. Do I see it? No, because I'm not even looking out the damn window. So whatever behavior I'm playing when I'm thinking, I'm the one that can't see it. And this is why for 40 years, I tell the same story. So here's 41 years. I go, what is it? I say, you have a friend and you know your friend's behavior very well. And you happen to know your friend's parent. And one day you see your friend has the exact same behavior as their parents. So you, you got to just tell them, you know, hey, Bill, you're just like your dad. Back away from Bill. I can tell you exactly what Bill's going to say. The first thing out of Bill's mouth, I know it. And it's going to say, how can you compare me to my dad? I'm nothing like my dad. The audience laughs. Why? Personal experiences. I go, do you understand what that story just said? The profound point. And I was what? Bill has behavior exactly like his dad. I said, where did he get it? I said, the first seven years, he downloaded it. He was in a state of uh, theta, which is hypnosis. He downloaded his dad's behavior. I say, but then when he's playing it, I say, why is he playing his dad's behavior? And that all of a sudden says, oh, because he's not paying attention. <laughs> so I say, then whatever behavior is coming out, it wasn't from the conscious mind that was busy thinking. So whatever behavior he's playing when he's not paying attention is from the program that he got from his dad. So he plays his dad's program. He doesn't see it. Reason why he doesn't see it, because his consciousness is not looking at the behavior, it's looking inside but everybody else sees it. And if that behavior isn't a very supportive behavior, he, then he is actually undermining his life without him even knowing about it. It was his invisible behavior that was sabotaging him, but he didn't see it. And I go, what would be the result of that? What would be the result? I have wishes and desires to go here and it doesn't manifest. And, uh, and then I have to say, oh, that person interfered with me. I'm a victim because of this thing happening. I'm a victim. I'm a victim. And I'm going, oh, guess what? <laughs> you have disempowered yourself because you are now claiming that your life is being controlled by outside forces without recognizing. No, it was your unconscious behavior that was playing 95% of the day that you didn't see, but everybody else did. We are creating this. Okay. Now, what's important about the story here uh, is the story of Bill is we are all Bill. <laughs> Every one of us, 95% of the day is playing programs because that's how much the average person is thinking. And if they're thinking, then they're playing programs that they're not even aware of because they're, it's unconscious behavior that's controlling them, not conscious behavior. Okay. And so I say, then this is the issue with the world because we've all perceived that we all have great wishes and desires and in not manifesting those, we don't look at ourselves. We say, oh, they, these people caused the problem. Well, you disempowered yourself because you say, I have no power. I'm a victim of those people. I go, no, you created those situations that led to your own self-sabotage. All of us do this all of the time. And the unfortunate part is without any awareness of what we just said, the average person says, 
it's not up to me, man. I'm a victim of the world around me, man. I wanted to be successful. It's not working. All these other people did this. And it's like, no, <laughs> you have to understand we do this ourselves and we don't see these programs. And uh, let me just help with one last thing in, uh, on this point. We got these programs before age seven. Okay. I said, guess what? You were being programmed. That computer of yours was getting downloads when? Be even before you were born. <laughs> last trimester of pregnancy, you were learning. Okay. You, you learned uh, from your whole first year of life from zero to one you were in a state of record of behaviors, okay? Tell me the program you got from zero to one. It's like, I don't know, it wasn't there. I got, okay, how about you were programmed a whole year from one to two? What programs did you get then? You go, I don't know, I wasn't there because my consciousness didn't even kick it until later. So the point is, for at least the first three years, you have been programmed with programs that control your life and you personally have no idea what the hell those programs are why you were not conscious when they were being downloaded so now we got a problem and said holy crap my life is being run by programs i don't even know what they are now i'm going to just help for one minute on that let's help just resolve this and it goes simply like this uh, and it basically says this the things that you like and they come into your life the things that oh I'm so, look i'm so happy look these things come in here they came in because you have a program to accept those things, acknowledge those things. But, and this is the capital but underlined bold print, the things that you work hard for, you struggle over, you sweat over, I'm going to make it, I'm going to do this, I'm putting a lot of effort into this baby, I'm working real hard to make this happen. Why are you working so hard? And the answer, and this is the beautiful part, whatever programs you got do not support that destination. And what you're trying to do is override the programs because you're not successful. You can say, I'm going to put a lot of work in. I'm going to make this happen. I go, you're going to have a lot of trouble here because the conscious creative mind that can make those things happen uh, is not relative in, in mathematics to the subconscious mind. And I mean, the subconscious mind is 1 million times more powerful and works 95% of the time versus the small conscious mind working 5%. I say, that's the one that's stressed. That's the one that's struggling. It says, I want something and I'm not getting it and I'm going to make it. And I go, you're trying to change the world when your own behavior was the one that was sabotaging it. And that's because you didn't see your programs. And like Bill, you engage these programs and you don't even know you have these programs. But then, as I said, well, if you want to see your programs, your life, 95% coming from the program, your life is a printout of your programs. The things you like, as I said, they come in, they came in because you have a program to acknowledge them. But if you understand the things you struggle over are not because the outside is preventing you from getting there. It was your own invisible 95% of the day playing programs you didn't even know you had. And that's where the sabotage comes from. And yet we want to blame and fix everybody on the outside and think that we're just the recipients of all this without recognizing we're the creator of all this. And that sounds like, oh, so new agey. And I go, listen, quantum physics is the most valid science on this planet. And principle number one, quantum physics, consciousness is creating our life experiences. You want to change your life? You don't change the world. You change your own consciousness. The world changes after that. Mm, beautiful. So uh, further on that point, this notion of sort of bottom-up behavior or subconscious behavior, which as you say, dominates 95% of our life, essentially the equivalent of, of hitting the turn signal, you know, on your car, but and that is a, is a relatively banal and prosaic example, but you can hit the turn signal on your life um, and you might be all of a sudden, you know, going in the wrong direction. And this might be associated with, oh, I don't know, like limiting beliefs, or maybe you had a parent who essentially told you that you weren't good enough um, and you spend your whole life uh, trying to please and be, and fit in and uh and of well course, let, let yeah. me just stop for a second you spend your whole life consciously wanting to please and change conscious mind but not recognizing well that's a great thought but that's not what you're manifesting because you're manifesting 95 percent of the time the problem that you think you want to override mm, yeah 
So what is the key to recognizing some of the more deleterious bottom-up behaviors and being conscious of them and being able to turn one's conscious attention such that we are not prey to this programming and that we have an opportunity to reprogram our lives in greater alignment with our wishes and desires. Yeah. You, you know, what's interesting. Most people have seen the movie, the matrix and it's listed under science fiction. I go, no matrix is a documentary. Why premise? Everybody's been programmed. Well, that's, that's not a premise. That's a reality. Everybody that's here had to have been programmed by the first seven years. It's the only way you can be here. But in the story, they said you could take a blue pill and when you take the blue pill, you wake up and the program is running just like it's always done. So life is exactly the same as it's always been. But then they offer, take a red pill and you get out of the program. I go, ooh, what would be the, you know, is there an equivalent of a red pill? I go, yes. And most everybody out there has experienced probably even you, Jeff. And I go, what is it? And I say, when we fall in love, immediately after that moment of experiencing love, your life changes. You could have blah, 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 blah every day. You meet this person, fall in love. 24 hours later, you're going, oh, life is so beautiful. Everything is great. The food's great. The music's great. Sex is beyond anything. I love uh, This is great. I love my life. I go, you have blah, 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 blah. And then 24 hours later, you had heaven on earth. I go, what happened? Biologists have recognized. You ready? It's the equivalent of the red pill. When you fall in love, you stop thinking. I go, what do you mean stop thinking? I say, you stay present. The words are stay mindful. I say, what does that mean? You stop thinking. You're engaged right now in the present moment. I'm actively engaged in the present moment. I'm not thinking about past, future. I'm right here, control. I go, oh, so you stop playing a program. I go, well, yeah, where'd the program come from? Subconscious, 95% of the time, 60% bad, okay? I said, well, what happens if you stop playing the program? I said, you stop playing the subconscious. Then I said, well, and who's controlling now? I go, the conscious mind. It used to be 5%. When you fall in love, it's over 90% is coming from conscious. What's that? Wishes and desires. I go, what did you manifest? Wishes and desires. The honeymoon, the heaven on earth life experience. I go, that was not an accident. It wasn't a coincidence. It was you stop playing the program and started living from the conscious mind, which is wishes and desires, and manifested heaven on earth. It was always there. It was always there, except if you're only using that mind 5% of the day, it's really tough to, <laughs> to, to experience that. But if you can use it 90% of the day, then your life actually is now heaven on earth, which is honeymoon. And all of a sudden I say, then what's the significance of this? And the answer was, it's the programs that have taken us away from health and vitality and harmony and peace and love. And if you stop playing those programs, then for that moment you stop, you are actually now creator of your life. And what will you create? Heaven on earth, because that's what everybody wants. <laughs> that's what you're going to get. Yeah. So interesting. So, um, you know, when I think of, um, kind of our five senses and, and in a sense we are pre-programmed to uh, perceive ourselves as separate from the world. Yes. And uh, you know, especially when you create this seven year substrate of, of programming that, you know, our eyes and, and, you know, everything that we're taught to uh, identify in the foreground and not the background, et cetera. And all of the labeling that then occurs from, you know, the most banal kind of labeling to then you get up to, well, there's someone of a different sexual orientation or political affiliation or, or, or whatever. And inherent in that uh, process is a labeling of self as separate from the world. And that is what I generally think of as the ego, the symbol that I actually give myself uh, to, navigate, um, to navigate the world. And when you talk about love, I, I very much associate love with a state of being um, similar to what the Buddha said about awakening, um, which is, is an epiphany or really a mystical experience 
that is a sensation of non-separateness, of integrated consciousness. And we feel that oftentimes in love or even in this conversation where I'm fully engrossed in every single word that you're saying, I'm right here, right now, and any feeling that I ever had of being a separate self has completely dissipated because I'm literally with you all there. And of course, I experienced that with my children and I experienced that with my community from time to time. And, and this is codified in, in a lot of Sanskrit words that I know, like mudita, like this idea of joy simply for someone else's joy or karuna, the kind of compassion that identifies someone else's suffering as your own. You know, these ideas that were these states of being where we don't feel like the ego, where we don't feel separate, where I guess we're not connected or run by this programming that we're essentially have an awakening. Yeah. Well, a, a lot of it has to do with something called mirror neurons. And I go, what are mirror neurons? They observe other people and, and have a sense of their emotion or whatever they're experiencing. And all of a sudden it says, that's very familiar to me. <laughs> I've experienced the same thing. And so when we watch somebody who is sad, and we have been sad in the past, then watching them, our mirror neuron plays back for us. What are they feeling? The same thing that we would feel when we're sad or when they're angry. Then we say, oh yeah, that's the same as I feel. That's what connects us to all the other individuals in the group to recognize we're all sharing these kinds of experiences like this. Uh, 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 and it's really so important. I mean, it, it's so much more primitive. I mean, dogs hunt in a pack. How, how they, they got a leader. I say, how, how the dogs do this? They don't talk like we do. And I say, no, they follow the leader because they know what the leader is doing because they've done it themselves. And then so by following the leader, they know how to engage their behavior to conform and coincide with the leader's behavior. We're going after this. We're going over here. I watch that leader. OK, we do that ourselves, as you just said, when you see someone who is, uh, you know, experiencing what you've experienced, then you have a sense of that, that compassion. OK, they're hurting. You, you can feel, oh, I know how they feel, why I hurt like that. And this allows us to connect with each other because we recognize we're seeing ourselves with different people, more or less. And we know what they're going through. And if it's something you don't want to go through yourself, then you're going to be compassionate to say, I want to help you get out just because I don't want to be there with you, <laughs> kind of thing like this. Uh, and that brings the community together. Community is to watch the other people, but know who or what they are because you have done this yourself. Uh, uh, and this connects us together. I don't have to talk to you. I could just watch you and I know what you're experiencing. Okay. And then if it's something that you're sad and, uh, and I say, you know, I feel that sadness. I don't want to be sad. Let's do something different. And then you help them do something different. You can help them get out of sadness. That's how it works. Okay. I can't help somebody get out of sadness if I don't even know they're sad. <laughs> so the first thing is I have to experience what they're experiencing. And this is a, a, a significant level of how we communicate with each other, not verbal, had nothing to do with verbal. You didn't have to ask them anything. Just watch them, the vibration, the energy. You will feel that just like, because when you have that energy, it created an experience in you. When you see them have that energy, you say, oh, I know what you're going through. I have had that myself. Yeah, we, we often um, draw this imaginary line between the internal and the external world saying that this is all the stuff that happens out there and, and this is me in here. But even this experience that we're having right now, uh, I mean, really, I'm just listening to waves with a certain amplitude and frequency in the air that you're creating through um, kinetic energy, through moving your lips, essentially, and that's going through all this technology. But it's it's and then, you know, vibrating my my eardrum and these tiny little bones in my ear and then, uh, you know, pushing down the, the auditory nerve and into my brain that finally decodes these these electromagnetic signals. And then my mind puts some sort of salience and valence <laughs> on top of that. And then I have some kind of emotional reaction to it. I'm like, oh, Bruce just said something. I'm so excited. I can't wait to respond or whatever. Um, but if you really kind of think about that is that out here in the world, 
what you said were simply sound energy. It was just waves. It was only when it was decoded by my brain that it had any sort of salience or meaning to me. And in that sense, there is no external world or the external world is completely internal. <laughs> and of course, I'm in the external world. So. As, weird, as weird as that sounds, that is what the principle of quantum physics is. All of this is a manifestation of consciousness and spirituality, according to quantum physics, which is interesting because they use the word spirituality, which conventional science doesn't use uh, because it's an energy field. Everything is energy. And, and to get down to the simple level is this. Everything is energy. And when things, energies interact, they can have various impacts on each other. I'll give the two extremes. Two energies come together and they're in harmony with each other. The result is you add up the energy of both, and that's a much more powerful energy. So two people with lower energies come together in harmony. They manifest an energy collectively that is more powerful. That's called uh, constructive interference. Uh, but I'll give you the name that people use. It's called good vibes. <laughs> good vibes. There's, you find yourself where the energy on the outside is in harmony with the energy on the inside. And then when the two come together, because they're in resonance and harmony, there's a, a feeling of more empowerment. In contrast, the other way is an energy uh, that is opposite of each other are, are called destructive interference. And I say, what does that mean? When they come together, they don't add up. They actually cancel each other out. So two energies can neutralize and there's no energy at all. That's called bad vibes. <laughs> and that's what you feel when you're feeling bad vibes. You're feeling a threat. Why? Your energy is compromised. You're feeling weak and vulnerable. So everything is an energy interaction. And it's so powerful. I go, you know what's interesting? Just to give us what, the meaning of it. Uh, I, I always use, I use the example of a snail. A snail comes out of an egg. There's no mother. There's no father. There's no snail school. I said, how the hell does a snail just come out of the egg? <laughs> Navigate the environment. I go, there's one gauge on the dashboard, energy. I go, significance, energy is life. <laughs> you have a lot of energy, got life. You have no energy, got no life. So basically the snail is moving around, reading the energy. If the energy is enhancing, constructive, good vibes, the snail keeps going that way. If the plant is, reads the energy plant, like shamans read the energy of this plant. Is the energy of this plant make me feel powerful or if I take this energy, it's going to cancel me. <laughs> it could kill me. Okay. Uh, well, it depends on the uh, on the gauge. Uh, if the gauge says, "Oh, this plant has higher energy. If I eat it, then that's my food." But if this plant, I read it and I feel weaker because my energy just got canceled. I said, "Don't eat that one. <laughs> take away your life." Uh, where do I go if the energy and the moving in direction is good? I keep going that way. But if all of a sudden I feel a, a cancellation of my energy. I'm going to turn around and go the other way. So I say, the entire behavior of that snail is predicated on what? Read the energy. And I go, guess what? Same for us. Yeah. <laughs> exactly the same for us. That we, we move according to our receptivity. You always move toward those people that give you better energy, higher energy, and avoid those people that cancel your energy. Bad vibes. I don't want to be here. I'm not going. No way. So uh, one thing that I really love about your work is how you have weaved together um, spirituality and science. And let me just say that, let me preface this question with this, is that faith has long been the providence of religion. In fact, over here is the realm of science. And you've managed to bridge this chasm between spirituality and empiricism. And, um, and I wonder if you could pull on that a little bit, because I recently revisited the Tao of Physics. I'm not sure if you ever read that book, but... Um, classic. That, classic. And it, it really does a great job at underscoring kind of how, the, how modern physics is pointing to many of the tenets and ideas posited by, by Eastern religion. But I, I wonder if you could just spend a, a little bit of time describing how you understand this relationship between science and spirituality. 
Okay, first thing is the hard part, and that is understanding the science, uh, making sense out of it in your life instead of just, oh, I memorized that fact and I took it on the exam and I wrote it down. I say, that didn't impact your life. How does it impact your life? Well, that's where I said we brought in quantum physics. Quantum physics said, first of all, the idea of a material physical universe is a, is a you know, an idea. Uh, it's not real. There is no physical universe. And I go, what do you mean there's no physical universe? I go, touch myself. Here I am. I see you. Uh, I go, it's a physical universe. I go, it's an illusion. I go, what do you mean? I go, because what quantum physics found out is the atoms that we perceived as the little bits of matter that come together and create us. Here is a piece of matter called Bruce, a lot of matter in here. Uh, the quantum physicists recognize that if you open up that atom and look deep inside, there's nothing physical in it. It's an energy. I go, so atoms are energy. I go, yeah. But when we perceive them, they look physical. I go, that's an illusion of light <laughs> that has to do with that. So it took me a while because I kept reading the science and going, oh, that sounds great. And it's like at some point it's like, no, wait a minute. What the hell does this really mean? Uh, and it means that we are energy beings, okay? There's no physicality here. And our energy uh, is then related to the energy of the world around us. Are we living in harmony with that energy or we're not living in harmony? Good vibes, bad vibes. That's what it comes down to, Okay. And then I started to recognize a very important thing, and this is the most important one for me personally, was no two people are the same in the sense that I can't take my cells and put it into your body because your body will say not self and your cells in my body, not self. So there's a self. And then I tried to find out, so where the hell is this self? And I say, well, there are antennas on the surface of the cell, like TV antennas. And no two people have the same set of antennas, meaning you're getting a broadcast different than I'm getting. I say broadcast. I say, yeah, the antennas are on the outside of the cell. They're reading something from outside. I go, oh, then who are we? I say, we are the broadcast being picked up by the antennas. We're not the antennas. We're the broadcast picked up by it. And I go, well, why is that important? Because the broadcast is an energy field. And I say, oh, then each of us has our own unique energy field. I go, yeah. And that was the part that transformed my whole life because it basically says, wait a minute. I'm receiving like the Bruce show, and this is the TV playing the Bruce show. You got the Jeff show in your physical body. And I go, when we were watching a TV and TV breaks, we say TV's dead. I go, yeah, TV's dead. It's not working anymore. My question, which I realized at some point was, did the broadcast die when the TV died? I go, no, it didn't. The broadcast is always here. You get another TV, plug it in, tune it in. You're back online again. I said, oh my God, I'm not this body. I am the broadcast being picked up by this television set that you see right here. And then the thing that hit me was the TV an uh, analogy. Well, the TV's dead, but I'm still here. I go, oh my God, we can't die. We were never even in here. <laughs> and that was the wake up call that said, the fear, which is human specific, is the fear of mortality. There's no other organism that knows it's going to die. And I say, that fear is what then we gave up our power to have somebody assuage that fear. It's like, oh, it's not so bad or whatever. You know, we, we bought what? Religion. Why did we buy religion? Well, I'm going to tell you about what happens after you die. The big mystery. And I say, oh, then all of a sudden, guess what? They made the program for my life. I go, who the hell are you to make a program for my life? Well, I bought it because I was in fear. And fear means I have no power. And when I have no power, I'm going to seek someone who says they have the power. And then I'm going to accommodate what they do. And so people join in a religion because they have the fear of the afterlife. Well, I'm going to tell you the beautiful part about my research was I didn't believe in spirituality, okay? I had no, to me, afterlife was, oh, I'm chemicals, and when I die, I go back into chemistry. You know, that's what it is. But when I understood this, I said, oh, my God, I'm an immortal entity. I'm a spiritual field, quantum mechanics, a field. And all of a sudden, I started to realize, oh, my goodness. I, 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 I have no fear. Why? I'm not going to die. I'm not even in here. So how the hell am I going to die? And once that fear was gone, my life was radically different. i tell you why. 
because we all live with that biological imperative that says, I'm afraid to die. <laughs> and I said, but what if you're not afraid to die? What if you don't see death as an end? What if you see it as just a transition into another way? And all of a sudden I say, what the consequence of that is? No fear. I say, then what does that mean? I say, then I'm more powerful because it was the fear that took away my power. And if I don't have fear, then you can't scare me. And I don't, I'm not scared. And I don't care about your rules about afterlife because I have my own understanding now. You don't have to try and tell me about afterlife. I know what I am. I'm a spirit. I'm an energy field. And, uh, and this was profoundly important because uh, as a science guy, I was like, wait, there's a spirit, a field, and a body. I say, why have both? Why not just be the spirit? That's, I, I always joke, I say, that's when I found out I had Jewish comedian cells. I said, what do you mean? <laughs> I said, I asked a question. Why have a body and a spirit? Why not just be a spirit? And my 50 trillion comic cells answered with a question. I asked why I have both. The answer came, Bruce, if you're just a spirit, what does chocolate taste like? That is the most profound thing. If I told you, you're going to have to think about that maybe for some period here, but I'm going to tell you it's the most profound thing that ever came into my head at that moment because it says basically, oh my God, the body provides us with sensations, pain, love, joy, happiness, anger, <laughs> whatever. It comes from this mechanism. It's a mechanism. The, the eyes take in light, but they don't, they, they don't see light back here in the brain. They see energy vibrations. Sound comes in my ears. I don't hear the sound. I hear the vibrations. Taste, that's a vibration. It's a chemical vibration. And all of a sudden, oh my God, this is a transducer. It takes life experiences in a body that gives us vision and smell and taste and touch and pain and love and joy. And, and I say, and this is sent back to our source. So we came here to have life experiences. And I go, at that moment of awakening, I said, oh, crap. Here's the major difference between men and women. <laughs> men are not allowed to have these sensory experiences. And I'll give you a reason. But women are. So women are sensitive. They, and that's a way of life for them. They're sensitive. And then they go, but, but men are so insensitive. I go, that was a program. We were programmed to be insensitive for a very simple reason. You cannot be a soldier if you're sensitive. You can't kill somebody if you're sensitive. So men have been knowingly programmed to lose sensitivity so they can be used to do those jobs like killing somebody else. And I go, oh my God, then I missed the reason for being on this planet. I missed the feeling of what is love all about? You know, what are these senses of joy and happiness? I'm not allowed to experience them as a guy because uh, that interferes with a soldier job. <laughs> I go, I'm wasting my life. And that was a wake up call. I said, well, damn it. Go out and taste it and touch it and feel it and smell it and do whatever you want. And if it's really good, do it again. And if it didn't work out so good, then don't do that one again. You came here to have these experiences. Why would you want to waste your life having all the negative fear, anxiety, the, all those problems? It was a choice. It was consciousness. But we didn't know that because we were programmed to be victim. And a victim has no power. And as long as you believe you're a victim, then you manifest victim. Uh, uh, and this is why I'm so uh, honored to be with you, Jeff, because you're experiencing this. You know this stuff. You're trying to get this message out to the other people. Why? To wake us all up. Because we came here to manifest heaven on earth, like falling in love. And I go, then what about all this war and pestilence and plague and, and all these things? I go, oh, that's a manifestation. <laughs> and we're manifesting it. You can live in this world without even being involved with all those things. You just have to change who you are and what you are and what you want, conscious mind, versus programs, subconscious mind. And when you understand this, you become empowered. And I say, empowered to do what? I say, create heaven on earth. <laughs> and then people think, oh, you die and go to heaven. I go, boy, is that a big mistake? Because you're going to get to the pearly gates. St. Peter's going to be there. And he says, well, how was your experience in heaven? He said, what do you mean? I said, you were on earth, right? That's heaven. Why? That's where you came to create. What'd you create? I go, oh, I don't want to wait to the end, man. 
my, my, my mother remarried when she was relatively older and she married this guy who was, I said, curmudgeon guy. He was not a really happy guy or anything. He lived to be like 95, 96 or something. He had cancer. My mother took care of him at home. The last week of his life, he essentially wasn't there. He was just comatose, more or less in the bed. And then two days before he died, he all of a sudden his eyes opened up. He was there. And he looked at my mother and he said, I didn't have any fun. And all of a sudden I just said, holy crap, he's going to die in two days. And he woke up today. <laughs> he didn't have any fun. I said, that's not me, babe. Because when I finish, it's going to be, that was great. <laughs> Let's do it again. <laughs> well, I will say if there's anything you know how to do, it's have fun, Mr. Lipton. <laughs> <laughs> Let me tell you, Jeff, I've, I had many years without it. <laughs> and once I started to recognize it and how come I didn't have it and how I could get it by changing my consciousness and my program and then ending up with, I honestly live heaven on earth. Does that mean everything I want happens? I go, nope. But you know what? When it doesn't happen, I'm not carrying it anymore. I don't care. I'll go on to the next thing. And as a result, I don't stew in the things that aren't working right and all that. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, you pointed to this earlier in the conversation, this notion of mindfulness of non-judgmental presence right here, right now in the everlasting now. And we're distracted so much of the time, focused on the trauma of the past and then projecting that into the future as some sort of anticipated negative memory um, that, uh, that we spend so much of our lives not here. Um, we're off somewhere else. Well, that's why I said the conscious mind's not even present. The conscious mind is thinking in the past or thinking about the future, but it's not, as you just said, here now. Well, I know that we're both refugees of the music industry or the music business or and as musicians. And, you know, some of my most epiphanous moments have been kind of lost in um, in music, in the in the creation of music, either by myself or in conjunction with others. And it, it's that cognitive absence and that absolute yoking of action and intention um that you know it's the it's i think a lot of people call that the flow state but it's um this uh you know it's it's mystical it's not jeff it's a honeymoon and i i should emphasize this very clearly because when you say honeymoon immediately oh that's a relationship with another person i go it doesn't have to be with another person you could be a chef and you get so into that cooking, uh, your joy and happiness, you're there, you're present. You're not thinking, you're, be, you're engaged in the present moment, consciousness. It could be gardening. It could be making music. <laughs> uh, so the idea is, it's unfortunate because I use the honeymoon because a lot of people have really had that experience where the life profoundly changed just within hours after meeting another person. And I go, there, there's a reason for that. But it doesn't have to be with a person, as you just mentioned, and it's very clear and very important. You can play music and you'll be in the divine land somewhere else, man. It's not here with these issues. You're creating another experience. Uh, and that is a honeymoon. Yeah. I mean, I watch my daughters dance, for example. And when they dance with no audience or no awareness of audience, they are just absolutely 100% there. And, you know, Alan Watts, often says, you don't dance to finish the routine. <laughs> Otherwise, the best dancer would be the fastest one, right? Um, there are some impressive fast dancers. You dance to dance. And, um, and we can live to live and love to love and do the dishes just to do the dishes, you know, as, as Thich Nhat Hanh said. It's, you know, it's always funny, and you just brought that up, because a lot of, a long time ago when people say, well, Bruce, do you meditate? And I go, no, I, I don't have any formal meditation or anything like that. But then I came up with the concept, you know, I love doing the dishes. I go, why? It's mindless. It's a procedure, A, B, scrub, warm water in your hands, feeling the warm water, it's really nice, and all that. And I go, it was an opportunity to let go of the world, doing a routine thing I didn't have to think about doing. And, that, and while I was free to think, 
then I was free to, it was a meditation. Meditation, you're free. Go think of something. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah. In Chinese, there's this notion of mu xin. So xin being mind, but kind of heart mind. And then mu xin is like without mind. And uh, it's very associated with um, wu wei or not forcing. Um, just functioning spontaneously with intuition not intuition as some sort of like instinct or like my gut told me to do it but a sort of refined skill of knowing how to apply the rudder in the river such that you're harnessing the power of water's course or applying the sail and tacking with the wind just right and i think you know to me that is living with the Tao of uh uh, refining this intuition to be right there where you can seamlessly interact inter interdependently with this emergent world. And that for me is spirituality. It's process. Like God is not material. It's not something. It's not an old geezer in a top hat and some cosmic panopticon with a sexual manual, you know, with an abacus judging your transgressions, you know, that's a, that's a form of delusional prophecy. It's really, for me anyways, studying nature deeply uh, such that I can understand the patterns of the metaphysical inside the physical and Focus my attention is such that I'm in alignment with that flow. Uh, that, that's amazing. Uh, look, I did the same thing. I was looking at cells. I was looking at nature, but interpreting what that experience was and then saying, I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Once I started to do that, that's when I understood the nature of my power to manifest my reality versus the program reality that was put into me. You know, this whole idea of programming is nothing new. You know, it's like 400 years the Jesuits have told their followers, give me a child until it's seven and I will show you the man. They knew exactly what we just said. Scientifically, seven years download program. Rest of life, 95% coming from program. They knew that from the very beginning. But then they were the first ones to go, wait a minute. What if we program that child for the first seven years? And all of a sudden, it's like, oh, my God, the first manipulation. And it's gotten much, much more uh, invasive and powerful when you can see an infant walking around. He can hardly walk, and he's carrying an iPad. But there's some programming going on here, folks, and, and this is what we have to be aware of. Yeah, this notion of structural, structuralism where we feel like we shape the world, but when we, uh, under closer examination, the world so often shapes the self. And I think this is part of having the great awakening is to realize where that has been the case and to, to find um, our ways of essentially being in the here and now such that we're not prey to this, this pre-programming. Right. Right. Um, you know, there have been a lot of, scientific paradigm shifts over the last 500, 600 years from, I guess, geocentrism to the earth orbiting around the sun or miasma theory, which was the prevalence theory for disease during the Black Plague, for example, and then migrating to this kind of uh, contentious thing between Pasteur and germ theory and um, and Bechamp and and terrain theory, which is something that I would I would love to explore with you at some point, and of course Newtonian physics to Einstein and Planck and quantum physics, and then basically how you've disrupted the scientific paradigm from genetic determinism to epigenetics, and wh where do you think we are on this spectrum? right now in terms of how humans understand the world uh, yeah well a very simple fact we're facing what is called the sixth mass extinction of life and i say there were five previous ones of course things that were natural like uh, earthquakes tectonic plate movements the last one 
The last mass extinction was 66 million years ago when a comet hit near the Yucatan Peninsula, a giant comet, and upended the web of life. And 75% of life disappeared at that moment, including all the dinosaurs who never came back either. Okay. Uh, and today we're in what is called the sixth mass extinction. And, and why this one is so different is that it's caused by our own human behavior. Our behavior is undermining the web of life. We're not living in harmony with the planet. We're separating ourselves, saying the planet is something we have domain over, we can control. I go, who the hell do you think you are? You're a piece of this nature. You are not the the boss of nature. And, and, and living with that belief that we can control nature, which was a mission statement of science, uh, how's that control working out? Well, we're going extinct <laughs> because what we learned is not in harmony with supporting us. So basically, this is a wake up call to humans and saying, either learn to live in harmony with nature or kiss it goodbye. I say, oh, is that like a thousand years from now? And I go, no, within the next few decades, civilization is facing what NASA scientists have identified as, listen, irreversible collapse. That means it's a collapse with no going back. <laughs> Because that going back is what caused the problem. It's going forward that we're being asked to do at this time. Nature is giving us a, a wake up call. It says you don't learn to live in harmony. A couple of decades from now, industrial civilization is going to totally collapse, and you won't. This whole thing's going to fall apart right away. So um, it's a wake up call, and the wake up call is for us to take responsibility. <laughs> for our lives on this planet. Uh, uh, and uh, this is why this wake up call of, I'm not a victim becomes important because when you're a victim, then you could let the whole thing fall apart and say, I have no responsibility. I was a victim of the whole thing. I go, no, you are a creator of this whole thing. There's no escaping that fact. But if you understand you're the creator, then that's the option to stop creating the hell that we're living in and start creating the heaven that we desire. That's the responsibility we're being faced with right now. And nature says, well, you got a short time. I'm going to give you a warning. Matter of fact, science has been telling the public for 15 years, we're in this extinction. And people are so preoccupied with everything else they're not paying attention to. The overriding issue of human civilization is we are going to extinction because we are not in harmony. Uh, and, and Jeff, you know, you mentioned being a musician. First thing is harmony. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, you know a band that doesn't have any harmony nobody's going to go play and go see that band <laughs> yeah and a note sitting in isolation by itself is not going anywhere it's only when it's in relationship to another note or a cluster of notes where you actually get harmony and i think in this era of self-isolation and division and polarization and atomization you know, closed systems devolve into entropy. We know that. So we can recognize ourselves as part of this web of life or, you know, nature is relatively neutral. It will just select for life. So maybe really the next, um, after this extinction, maybe it looks like, you know, just a half a billion humans. I mean, of course, like, you know, this, I don't want to get modeling about it, you know, um, <laughs> But, but maybe there is a higher evolved humanity or life on the other side of this thing. I don't well, know. Well, this is what we're moving to right now. This is the renaissance in science that says, hey, you know the beliefs that you built your life on? Well, most of those are wrong. <laughs> and now we have new science. We have quantum physics. We have epigenetics. We have uh, fractal geometry. We have these new visions that say, wait a minute. We were not seeing it correctly. And this is a correction factor. Are you going to see it correctly? Well, you got a few decades, a couple of decades. And if you do it, we're going to thrive into the future. And if you don't do it, then just kiss it goodbye because it's coming to an end. Yeah. Well, Dr. Bruce Lipton, I'll be there holding your hand. In this, uh, <laughs> well, we'll be dancing it, at that point. Jeff, it will be so dancing yes. in, uh, in this um, full-throated effort to try to get humanity to understand itself as an interconnected web or what the Buddhists call Indra's net um, that, you know, we are part of this emergent spontaneous world that, that arises dependently, that there is no such thing as a, 
completely disjointed individual. Now you've studied, you've studied human cells. So if you were to look at my hand uh, and study it on a cellular level with, uh, I love your description of your first experience with electron microscope, by the way. But anyways, um, if you were to study my hand on a cellular level, you could look at each cell and all the space around it, but you would never recognize this as anything but a hand, you know? And, um, and this is, I think, one of the great quandaries of relativity theory, um, that we all do exist as these uh, sensitive individuals, um, and we're distinct, but we're not in any way disjointed. And uh, I think this is like the transition that we have to go um, through from this form of spotlight consciousness to a form of floodlight consciousness, like our friend Anina Murjani describes. And, um, and this is a, a difficult task because, you know, as you say, we're so culturally programmed in a hyper individualistic world, and we have these particular sensory organs that make us feel so separate. And so this is why your work is so important because it can wake people up. It can literally elicit a spiritual U-turn in someone's life. And then all of a sudden it, they're effusive and, uh, and animated and full of energy and connecting and creating that constructive energy that you talk about. And of course, ugh, man, that's just the best kind of virus. <laughs> well, for me, Jeff, this is, you know, uh, well, I have a message I also emphasize, but you are an important component of this evolutionary change because you have an audience where you can offer them some more powerful insights into who they really are and get out of this victim mode because when you're out of this victim mode and you become the creator, I'll tell you, there's nothing more exciting than to be a human on planet Earth who is part of the whole network of life and, and experiencing in that positive way. And so I just want to thank you for letting me have the soapbox for a little while. But I need to say thank you because you've gathered the people necessary that will take this information and collectively, we can create that world that we talk about. It is heaven on earth. I hate to have people, you know, screw up their life like my my, my former stepfather who gets all the way to the end and then says, oh, I missed it. <laughs> it's too damn late, man. Don't miss it. It's here now. It is the most beautiful, experience uh, that you could ever imagine to be a human. But not if you buy the programs and get lost into the control manipulation, uh, and then you've lost the power and you've lost the joy, and now it's a job. And I don't see life as a job. I think life is a as a reward. <laughs> you know, it's like, wow, we get to live here? Are you kidding me? This is beautiful. Yeah. What so a miracle. I, I want to say thank you. I thank you. Thank you to our audience again, because it's with them when we collectively do this that the world becomes something completely different. And it's a wake-up call, and you're here to offer some answers and hope in this wake-up call. So I, I need to thank you for offering this to the public and for our audience who's out there listening because they are the elements of evolution themselves. And when they get it, the world gets, it's going to be heaven on earth, which is actually what it's supposed to be. So thank you. Dr. Bruce Lipton, thank you so much. Uh, to be continued, I hope. So many topics that yes. we covered and yes. so many others that I would love to excavate at a, at a future date. So The beautiful part is we have future. Yes, we do. Thank Grateful you, for you. Thank you. Hey, thanks for watching. If you like this interview from the Commune Podcast, then click subscribe and check out this video right here.